بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ثم أما بعد we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Lord of the heavens and the earth and we ask him to send his peace and blessings upon our master Sayyiduna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam upon his blessed family, loyal companions and all of those who followed after with excellence up until the day of standing Ameen, Ameen, Ameen thereafter the topic that um, we've chosen to discuss tonight is a very important topic as we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran al Kareem an entire surah known as Surah Al-Nisa the surah of women but we don't find a surah known as Surah Al-Rijal Right, we don't find a surah known as the surah of men. We find a surah which is surah al-nisa, surah of the women. And this, there's many significant reasons why Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned surah al-nisa, an entire surah named after women. And some of those reasons are highlighted within the initial verses of the surah, where there were great injustices done towards women, and disregard towards women, and so on and so forth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed them right at the beginning of the surah. For example, uh, in inheritance, people would deprive women of any type of ownership of any type of land, estate, property, wealth, whatsoever. If their parents passed away, if their husbands passed away, if members of their family, close members of their family passed away, they would be totally deprived of all types of mirath and inheritance. So Allah Azza wa Jal spoke about inheritance right at the beginning of the surah. So this indicates to us the importance of women in the Quran al kareem and the importance of giving them their rights and what's due for them. If we look at the state of the Arabian Peninsula at the time when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent, uh, women were given such disregard in all terms by men uh, they weren't even treated like human beings at certain instances, right? And especially at m very difficult times when, for example, women are going through their menses, their uh, monthly periods, women would not be allowed to stay in the same house. They wouldn't be allowed to cook. They wouldn't be able, allowed to interact with their husbands, with family members. The Prophet wasallam had to change this not only with his blessed words, but with his blessed character and how he interacted with his blessed wives and his blessed daughters and the female companions uh, around him. Now, oftentimes, um, we don't have too much time, so I'm going to kind of quick move along quick. Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad. Oftentimes, uh, women are given such disregard, it's unbelievable, right? I had a friend, he said to me that, um, he said I had a boy, a baby boy, and I had lots of relatives come to my house and everybody was so happy and giving me congratulations and mubaraks. And he said then I had a daughter after and I saw a big difference. And even those who came to give me congratulations, I didn't see the cheerful faces that I saw when I had my son. So he said I spoke to my mother and I said what's all this about? This jahili, this ig, uh, uh, this trait of the times of ignorance still exists among some Muslims but if it exists amongst Muslims it doesn't mean that it exists in Islam Islam takes its character from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam not from me and you uh, there's a Muslim uh, uh, lady who I work with on some projects and she's a convert she converted many years ago and she said to me uh, that she said to certain Muslim certain Muslims she said had I seen you before Islam I would have never converted but I'm lucky I met Islam before I met you do you get it so we have to be very clear me and you are not the examples sorry if I'm being very abrupt and blatant me and you are not the examples the only example is Sayyiduna Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa sallam you know, uh, when I was given this title, I said to one of the brothers, I said, is it just like my Jummah khutbahs for the past three weeks? 
My Juma khutbas are, for the past three weeks has been about, about the women in Islam and the women companions and how women were treated. Do you know that there weren't little boys running around in the house of the Prophet wasallam because all of his male children would die as infants for reasons that we know so that people don't say after he passes on that these boys are prophets now and so on. All of his male children would die young. Who is playing around in the house of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Four girls: Zainab, Ruqayya, Umm Kulthum, and Fatima radiyallahu anhunna ajma'in. He had four girls playing in his house, and then we don't know how to treat our women and bring up our girls. It doesn't make sense. He didn't have any boys in his house, and then when he passes away sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he had nine wives. None of them complained about him. They found the best of character from him. They, they lived in the best of marriages that anybody could ever imagine. And then we have Muslims not knowing how to deal with their wives, not knowing how to treat their young girls and so on. It's because we want to live the Islam that people are living around us and not the Islam that he taught us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then people ask about scholarship, Muslim women scholarship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Qur'an. What did he say? He said, وَذْكُرْنَ مَا يُتْلَى فِي بُيُوتِ كُنَّ مِنْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ Allah said, and revise and remind yourselves and recite مَا يُتْلَى فِي بُيُوتِ كُنَّ That which is being revealed and recited in your homes of what? From the verses of Allah and wisdom. What's wisdom? The Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Sayyida Aisha radiyallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, she was one of the greatest scholars of Islam. She was one of the six companions who narrated the most hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And guess what? Sayyidina Abu Bakr lived his uh, childhood, his teenage days, his adulthood, his old age with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam day and night. But guess what? He could not narrate what his daughter Aisha narrated from the intimacy of her home. He couldn't narrate that because he didn't live in the intimate intimacy uh, in the innermost areas of the house of the Prophet ﷺ. Who was it narrating to us the inner, the most secret life and private life of the Prophet ﷺ was narrated to us by whom? None of the men companions, all by the women companions, all by his blessed wives radiyallahu anhun. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when he came into this world, do you know there was no man in his house? When the Prophet was born, there was no man in his house. His father had died and he didn't have any brothers. Who was in his house? His mother, Amina radiallahu anha, and that's it. And you know when he died? When he left this world? He left this world whilst his blessed head was in the lap of a woman, Aisha radiallahu anha. Doesn't this show us the honor of women in Islam that he enters into this world in the lap of a woman and he exits from this world in the lap of a woman? And these women from his home were the greatest scholars who taught us about the most private life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You know Sayyida Aisha radiyallahu anha she says, "Ya jildi jildahu." She says, my skin would touch his skin, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My skin would touch his skin, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then, then listen to the words of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then he would say to me, if you allow me, I would like to stand before my Lord now. At night, after he would have uh, fulfilled the rights of Aisha radiallahu anha, he would ask her for permission and say, Now if you allow, I'd like to stand before my Lord and pray. What, did I, what, would, what would Aisha radiallahu anha say? She would say, Messenger of Allah, Messenger of Allah, I give up my wishes for yours. I give preference to what you are pleased with, even though I like to be close to you. Even though I like to be close to you, I know at this moment now, you would wish to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After she would give him permission, he would stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When women were treated like this by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that's when you saw within women, scholars and learned people, when they were treated like this. 
Sayyida Fatima Zahra, radiyallahu anha, the blessed daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when she would arrive into the gathering of the Prophet, he would stand, walk towards her, kiss her on her forehead, and seat her besides him. So much honor and so much dignity that she, he would show her. This is how the male companions, who in their days of Jahiliyyah, were so vicious against women, that's how their character transformed, and that's how they learned from the Prophet how to treat women. Because they saw how he treated his women. And what did he say? He said, مَا أَكْرَمَ النِّسَاءِ إِلَّا كَرِيمٍ وَمَا أَهَانَهُنَّ إِلَّا لَئِيمٍ He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, nobody except an honorable person honors women. And nobody except a lowly person debases women. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this was one of the last and final things he said before he left this world. And he said this also in the khutbah of Hajj, in the sermon of the Hajj that he delivered. What did he say? He said, Ala fastawsu bin nisa'i khayra. He said, I give you good counsel concerning women. Look after your women. Take care of your women. Show love to your women with respect. With respect. You know, some people, they think, uh, I'm going to show love to my wife whenever I wish. It's like a charity. Whenever I want to take some sadaqah out of my pocket, I'll just drop it into the mosque box and that's fine. It doesn't work like that. You show love with respect. You show love with respect and that's when it's true love. The Prophet وسلم, loved Khadija radiallahu anha so much that even after she passed away, there wasn't a day except that he would mention her. There wasn't a day except that he would mention her. So much so that Aisha radiallahu anha said, one day I became jealous and I said, Messenger of Allah, Allah has given you better than that old woman. Allah has given you a young lady. And the Prophet would become angry and say, Allah has not given me better. There was nobody better than Khadija. She stood besides me when people turned their backs on me. She protected me when I had no security. And she gave me when people turned away from me, when people didn't give me. That Khadija, Radiallahu anha, the Prophet not only honored her, but also honored all of the friends of Khadija. Women would come to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he would give them so much attention and welcome them in such a manner that Aisha would ask, Messenger of Allah, who are these women? And the Prophet would say, they used to come to us in the days of Khadija. They're the friends of Khadija who used to visit us. When women were shown love like this, that's when you had scholarship amongst the women of Islam. Not amongst one or two, all of the women of Islam were learned women. All of them, even the grandmothers, they were learned people. They knew their religion. They knew their religion. And amongst them, we've heard of the great scholar of Islam, whose name was Abu al-Fadl. His name was Abu al-Fadl Ahmad, and famously known as, and his title was Shihab al-Din. And he, he is famous known as Al-Imam ibn Hajar. Imam Ibn Hajar was that scholar, he was an encyclopedic scholar who wrote the best commentary on Sahih al-Bukhari ever, known as Fath al-Bari. Imam Ibn Hajar, he heard that Karima al-Marwaziyyah had come to his city. He left from his home and he went to Karima al-Marwaziyyah and he recited the entirety of Sahih al-Bukhari to her in eight days. In eight days, he recited the whole of Bukhari to her. Do you know why? Because she was the greatest scholar of Hadith in his time. And you know what his title is? Amirul Mu'minina fil Hadith. He was the leader of the believing people in Hadith. Scholarship like this. When I was in Damascus just recently, uh, I came back in 2006 before all of this turmoil has started. There was over 28 women who had memorized all of Bukhari and Muslim. Literally thousands of hadith. And the amount of women that had memorized the Quran in all of the dialects are uncountable. The amount of women who memorized the Quran Kareem were uncountable. Why? Because when women grew up in homes where they were shown love, they were shown care, they were shown respect and honor, their attachment to the religion was like this. One of the greatest women that we read about in the history of Islam, and there's many, there's many. One of the greatest women that we read about is that great woman who has the honor of building the first university in the world. 
Her name was Fatima Al Fahriya, radiallahu anha, and she was from Morocco. And if you go to Morocco today, you still find the University of Al Qarawiyin. Al Qarawiyin, it's the oldest university upon the planet, right? She, her father was a very rich man. Her father was a very rich man, and he left behind a lot of wealth. When he died, Fatima inherited a lot of wealth. So she thought to herself, if I just spend this wealth like the people of the world, one day I will perish and I will die and nobody will hear about me and my wealth. How about I spend this wealth in a way such that the name of my father will be mentioned until the end of time and people will remember him for the good that he done in what? In not leaving wealth behind, but in leaving behind a daughter who had such intelligence and who had such understanding. There's lots of people who leave wealth behind, but it just disperses and it's gone this way and that way. What's the greatest wealth that a person can leave behind? The Prophet ﷺ said, when the child of Adam dies, everything ceases. All his actions come to an end except A pious, righteous child who prays for him. A pious, righteous child, right? And that's not only male children, that's female children too. And female children are more important than the male children. You know why? Because they're the mothers of the children. They're the mothers of Islam. If they have love in their hearts, understanding of the religion, they have knowledge, without a doubt their children will be running around the house reciting Surah Al-Fatiha and Surah Al-Ikhlas. Their children will be going to sleep reciting Tala Al-Badru Alayna and saying, Oh Allah, show me the Prophet in my dreams. But if we don't take care of our women, then who's going to take care of our children? Who's going to who's going to be take care of the generations of Islam to come after us? You know, a few weeks ago in the khutbah, I said it pleases our hearts when we hear that so many women are coming to coming into Islam. The highest rate of converts are from amongst the women. But you know what I said? I said, but my heart cries tears of blood. Because I know the opposite also, that the highest rate of women, uh, the highest rate of Muslims leaving Islam is also from amongst the women. Is also from amongst the women. Why is that? So Fatima al-Fahriya radiallahu anha, she decided that she was going to build a masjid and build a madrasa, build a school and a masjid, and she was so determined. And you know when women put their mind to something, they're not like men. One of our teachers, he said, you know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to deliver khutbah whilst he was leaning on a tree. And you know when the Sahaba started to travel around the countries, they saw the kings and emperors of the world sitting on big thrones. And they, when they came back to Medina and they saw their beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam leaning on a tree and giving a khutbah, they began to cry. Umar radiallahu an came and said, Messenger of Allah, the kings of the world and the emperors of the world, they sit on thrones and you're standing beside the palm tree delivering a khutbah. And he began to cry. And then a woman from the Ansar, a woman from the Medinan women came and she saw the Messenger of Allah delivering a khutbah from beside the tree. She didn't cry. She went and built a member and brought it back for him. She went and built a member and brought it back for him and she placed it in the masjid. Women, when they do something, they're determined about it. You know, I recited a verse to a friend of mine who's a doctor, in which Allah says, Allah says, مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِنْ قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِهِ Allah has not placed in a single man two hearts in one chest. He said to me, that's very interesting, because women can do multiple jobs at the same time. Whereas men, they just about get one done. You get it? So Fatima al fahriya she was so determined, like women are determined. She was so determined that she's going to do this. She decided that she will fast from the day that this masjid and madrasa will start its construction work till the day it's complete. Every single day she fasted until that madrasa and masjid was complete. Allah said, لَمَسْجِدٌ أُسِّسَ عَلَى التَّقْوَى مِنْ أَوَّلِ يَوْمٍ أَحَقُّ أَن تَقُومَ فِيهِ 
and a masjid that's built upon the foundations of piety from the first day, that has greater right that you stand in it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected that masjid that was built by that woman for hundreds of years and people still studying and visiting it till this day. Huh? Till this day. When women understand their religion, then they can puzzle the greatest of scholars. You know, uh, Imam al-Razi, Fakhruddin al-Razi, he was a genius in his time. You know, his geniusness was in logic. His geniusness was in, uh, in, in, in logic and very logical arguments. And he came into Baghdad. And you know, when the people of Baghdad heard about Fakhruddin, they came rushing. The greatest scholar of the time coming to Baghdad, they went to receive him. And there was an old woman in her home, in her home, <coughs> and she heard all of this noise. She said to somebody, what's going on in the streets? You know, why are these people rioting? <laughs> why are they protesting? What are they doing? She said, don't you know Fakhruddin is coming into Baghdad? She said, Who's, who on earth is he? And she, they said to her, he's a man, he's a scholar who has 300 evidences for the existence of God. How many? 300 evidences for the existence of God. And she said, big deal. If he didn't have 300 doubts, he wouldn't have 300 evidences. <laughs> Somebody went and told Imam Fakhruddin what this old woman said. He began to cry. You know what he said? He said, Allahumma imanan ka iman al ajaiz. He said, oh Allah, give me iman like the iman of these old women. Firm, determined, set in their ways. Why? Because of the purity of what they were taught and what they were nurtured upon from a young age. They grew up in homes where Quran was recited. They grew up in homes where the Prophet was described. They grew up in homes where the Prophet ﷺ was the one who was spoken about the most. Who was spoken about the most. Nowadays, you, you ask children, how do you go to sleep? I, I watch my cartoons. Where? In your living room? No, I have a television in front of my bed. And you speak to the parents, they say, oh, well, my child can't sleep until he or she watches his cartoons and his movies. Right? And you think, where have the mothers gone who used to teach their children Tala al Badru alayna before they used to sleep? Where have, the ch where have the mothers gone who used to teach their children, son, daughter, go to sleep? and pray that Allah shows you the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in your dreams. Where have those mothers gone? Why has scholarship and, and uh, Islamic knowledge and learning disappeared from our homes? You know when people say that we need women scholars? That's really scary. If we don't already have them. If we don't already have them, that's scary. Because every woman has to be a scholar of Islam. I remember I was studying with one of my teachers and we were in a lesson like this and he said to us, he said, all of you are teachers. And some of us thought, no, we're not. He said, if you have children, then every one of you has to be a teacher. Every parent has to be a teacher and you can only be a teacher if you know something. And what is it that mothers have to teach their children? They have to instill into their hearts Love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allimu awladakum thalatha khisal. Teach your children three traits. What are they? Hubba nabiyikum. Wa hubba ali baytihi. Wa tilawati al-Quran. And just listen to this order. The Prophet said, teach your children how to love your Prophet. How to love his family and how to recite the Quran. Loving the Prophet came before reciting the Quran. Loving his family came before reciting the Quran. You know why? Because children love characters and we love characters. And we like stories. And one of the best of stories is to speak about the stories of the Prophet To speak about the stories of the Sahaba and the Ahlul Bayt and the family of the Prophet and if we're saying that our women are not learned and they don't know about the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then how on earth our children gonna 
grow up loving the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They grow up loving Tom and Jerry. Do you get it? So, learning and studying this religion amongst women is a must, as it is a must upon men. It's equal, but the importance of it for women is so much more greater. Why? Because they are those human beings who no man can deny their virtue over them. No man can deny. You know the man who came to the Prophet and said, who, who, who has the greatest right of my service? He said, your mother, your mother, your mother. And then he said, your father. So every man is indebted to a woman. Nobody can ever say, I'm not indebted to my mother. Regardless of how pious his beard becomes and how big his imama goes. You're not going to get to paradise unless you're at the feet and you're the service of your mothers. The greatness of a woman in Islam is much more than the, that of a man. And that's evident from this hadith of the Prophet That's clear from how the Prophet's house was constructed. It was all women, his four daughters and his nine wives. So we have to reassess ourselves and turn back to Islam. Because we, all of us, we have been given a bad name to the Muslims and to Islam. A bad name to our predecessors who honored their women, who respected their women, and whose women ended up to be, be scholars who used to teach their children. Do you know, if you read through the biographies of the scholars of Islam, it always says that this scholar, the first thing that he did was memorize the Quran. Do you know where they used to memorize the Quran? At home with their mothers. Their mothers were teachers of the Quran. They were scholars of the Quran. These children would not leave their homes except that they would have memorized the Quran. Why? Because their homes were places where there was women scholars. Every mother was a scholar of Islam. It can't be that a woman is not a scholar, is not learned in the religion. Otherwise, what are they doing? Watching movies? Browsing Facebook, going through YouTube. It's crazy. When I was in Syria, I met a Sheikh. His name was Sheikh Abdul Rahman. He's from the city of Hama. And I learned a lot from him, even though I didn't sit with him for long. He was an amazing man. And one of the things that he said to us, he said, I have, he mentioned, I have a few children. He said, you know, my daughter, she has nearly finished memorizing Riyadh al-Salihin two volumes of a book of hadith at home she didn't go to a madrasa she didn't go to a school a seminary she done it all at home why because in homes where qala rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is being echoed and is being heard by these children from their mothers are going to be homes in which the prophet is remembered are going to be homes in which the prophet is praised are going to be homes in which the prophet is venerated are going to be homes in which the Prophet is honored, are going to be homes in which the Prophet is followed. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, all of the women of Islam were scholars. Whether they came out to teach or not, they taught their own children. Do you know why we have Islam up to our generation so strong? Because our mothers were learned in the religion. Our mothers were learned. And when, when I say that they were learned, it doesn't mean whether they could read complex texts of Islam, complex books of Islam. No. Islam could be read from their characters. Islam could be read from their lifestyles. Islam could be read from their affiliation to the religion. It could be read from their association with the Prophet ﷺ. How they were connected on to the love of the Prophet ﷺ. Our teachers told us a famous story about a woman who went to Medina al Munawwara and she wasn't, she was an unlettered woman. She couldn't read or write. So she stood before the Prophet ﷺ and giving her salam. And suddenly she saw another woman come beside her and she had a book and she was reciting from this book all the different variations of salam to the Prophet. This, <coughs> this elderly woman, she began to cry and she rushed home. And she said to herself, well, my salam is not going to be accepted because this woman is reading her salam in such an eloquent way. 
That night she saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in her dream and the Prophet said, we accepted your salam before hers. Hearts that were connected unto Islam like this, how do you expect their children to come out? Do you expect their children to come out loving the Prophet and sacrificing everything for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his ways and his style and his fashion? And in the Quran al kareem Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us examples of women who even the prophets envied. Even the prophets envied. Who? The mother of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, Sayyida Maryam alayhi salam. She was a woman of worship. And when she worshipped in her mihrab, what happened? Zakaria alayhi salam passed by. What did he see? He saw unseasonal fruits unseasonal fruits he said to Maryam where did you bring these fruits from and she said these have come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when Zakaria السلام, who was a prophet of Allah saw this miracle that this woman is given unseasonal <coughs> fruits what does Allah say in the Quran Allah said Hunalika da'a Zakaria Rabba at that position, at that point, where Maryam السلام, used to worship Allah, that's where Zakaria السلام, stopped and he made dua to Allah and he said, Oh Allah, if you can give this woman unseasonal fruits, then I'm asking you to give me an unseasonal child. Because he was an old man by now. That dua at the point of the worship of that woman was accepted for Zakaria السلام, who was a prophet. Maryam السلام, was not a prophet. She was indeed a righteous, pious woman. She was a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But du'as of prophets were accepted where women of worship and knowledge and righteousness sat. What does that indicate to us? And we have the great woman of Islam, Sayyida Nafisa radiallahu anha, who's buried in Egypt. She was one of the great granddaughters of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Do you know Imam al-Shafi'i Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i radiyallahu an, one of the greatest scholars of this ummah. He used to go to her grave and make du'a to Allah subhanahu wa taala in the vicinity of her grave, and he used to say, "Making du'a here is accepted by Allah." Why? Because of the righteousness of this woman. We have the example of Rabi al adawiya al-Basriya radiyallahu anha whose worship and whose knowledge and whose gnosis for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was such that all of the men of Islam have envied this woman forever. Why? She was a great lover of Allah. She was a great worshipper of Allah. And she set the path of worship unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when after every prayer she used to raise her hands and say, Oh Allah, if I worshipped you for, pa for paradise, then keep me away from it. If I worshipped you in fear of the fire, then throw me in it. And if I worshipped you just for your sake, then don't deprive me of yourself. Du'as like that were never heard by men. This was heard from a woman. These were the righteous, pious, scholarly, knowledgeable women that we had in Islam. And every mother of Islam was a knowledgeable woman. And you know the courage and the bravery of the women of Islam was such that they would send their children out to study and learn afar from their homes, afar from their homes, not worried about the welfare of their children because they knew that they had sent their children out in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you send somebody out in the way of Allah, why do you have to worry for? Then Allah will take care of that person. Look at the great scholar of Islam, Shaykh Abdul Qadir al Jailani radiallahu anhu. His father died when he was young. What happened? His mother looked after him and his mother gave him permission to go to Baghdad and study with the greatest scholars of Islam and he became the most righteous man that this ummah ever saw. She was, she was a single mother and we have lots of single mothers nowadays. Do you know Imam al-Bukhari, his mother was a single mother? Imam al-Shafi'i, his mother was a single mother? Imam al-Shafi'i, his mother took him from Gaza in Palestine all the way to Makkah al Mukarramah so that he could study with the great scholars of Islam. And then from Makkah to Medina al Munawwara, and she seated him in front of Imam Malik, Imam Udar al Hijra, so that he could study with the religion of Islam. These were the 
courageous women that we had. You know, a few days ago, I was thinking, I was thinking when I went out to study, I was out for seven years. I thought of the courage of my mother, the how she parted from her children for seven years. But then, you know, when I thought about my grandfather, I was even more amazed. My grandfather was blind, his brother was blind, and his sister was blind. And all of them were orphans. Their father had died when they were young. Their father had died when they were young, and they were extremely poor. Do you know how poor they were? My grandfather used to tell me whilst he used to cry. He used to say that the day that my father died, we didn't have anything to put him on to take him to the graveyard. We didn't have anything to carry him on to take him to the graveyard. And he was blind. My grandfather was blind. His brother was blind. His sister was blind. And people used to say to my great grandmother, why don't you send your children out to beg? Because people will give them. And she used to say, my children, they've got such self-esteem that they say we will never extend our hands before anybody. And they never used to go out to beg. And then in his teens, my grandfather in his teens, he left from home and he traveled to the other side of the country, to the borders of India, and he memorized the Quran. And when I think about that, that he lived, he did this about a hundred years ago. I think, wasn't his mother concerned about him, worried about him? There were no, he couldn't write a letter. He couldn't send a message. He couldn't phone home. He couldn't send a text message. Nothing like that. And then his brother left out after him and he memorized the Quran and both of them became scholars of Islam and returned to their lands and taught for, for, for decades. This was the courage of a woman. They were living off the confidence, the strength and the courage of a woman who knew the truthfulness of her religion, who sensed and experienced the greatness of her religion that she was able to part from her blind children for years and years and years, not knowing about their welfare, but knowing that they are in the care of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see the importance of Muslims having learned women is much more important than having learned men. Because if you don't have learned women, you're not going to have learned men. Full stop. It's impossible. You will not have it. Right? And if women are not treated well, you know what I said on the Jummah a few weeks ago? I said, why do you expect women to come to the masjid? When they see men who come to the masjid, hear the Jummah khutbah, and then they return to their homes and become barbaric against their women. Why would those women want to come to the masjid? After seeing these men who have attended the masjid and gone back and behave the way they behave. Why do you expect the women to come to the masjid? Unless you leave from the masjid and show the love that the Prophet showed Khadija to your wives, your wife, women will not come to the masjid. Your daughters will not come to the masjid. You have to show love and care, respect and honor to your women because they are the mothers of your children. They are the mothers of society. From them blossom the flowers of society. From them come the fragrances of society. And this is how this religion has existed for the past 1400 years without a doubt it's been existing on the strength and the confidence of the great women who were behind those great men and behind every man there is a great woman and if there isn't a great woman you won't find greatness in those men so we have to be very careful and very caring and very uh, we have to show love you know, I had a case a few weeks uh, a few weeks ago of an old man. He came to me in the masjid and he was crying his head off. He was saying, my daughter's become Christian. Can you speak to my daughter? I said, I can speak to her at any time. I went to their house and I spoke. I sat with his daughter. I let her speak. It's not my turn to speak now. It's too late for me to speak. I've been speaking for years in the masjid, but they didn't... They didn't decide on bringing their children to the masjid at that time. So, when she spoke, this young girl, she spoke, she said, I was having a crisis in life and I only found love from Jesus. I said to myself, indeed, there is love in Sayyidina Isa, Jesus. 
But only if this girl had been shown the love of Sayyiduna Muhammad from where Isa alayhi salam took love. Only if this girl knew about the way the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam loved women and honored women, she wouldn't have ended up where she's ended up. So we have to take extra care, especially in the times that we live in. Because there are people from all directions wanting to take vulnerable people from our community out of this religion. And women have been vulnerable today and yesterday and always. Why? Why are they vulnerable? Because they have very soft, gentle hearts. And you know soft, gentle hearts need softness and they need care. If soft, gentle hearts are confronted with harshness, they lose that softness. When they lose it, they, they become at unrest. When they become at unrest, they want to find and search for that comfort and that ease that is a natural disposition of their heart and then wherever they find it, they will find, take it. So we have to be very concerned with our women. And women have to be concerned with themselves also. That we have to become learned women. We have to become women who know our religion, know our Quran, and in particular know the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. I said a few weeks ago that we should start a campaign that children should not be taught how to read the Quran in masjids no more. What should, be, what should they be taught? They should be taught the life of the Prophet ﷺ. They should be taught who he was, how he lived, how he behaved with people, how he interacted with others. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm gonna just say one story and finish of the love and care the Prophet had for women. Do you know <coughs> who knows the name of Sayyiduna Ali's mother? What was her name? Excellent, well done. You see, none of the men replied. <laughs> <coughs> Why don't we know? I'm not going to have a go at you now. <laughs> Alright? Her name was Fatima bint Asad radiyallahu anha. You know when she died? You know what the Prophet did? After digging her grave, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa went down into her grave and he, la he lay down. He lay down in the grave of Fatima bint Asad. And then he stood up and then he took Fatima radiallahu anha and placed her in her grave and then he came out. The companions asked, Messenger of Allah, why did you lie down in her grave? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with tearful eyes, he said, I lay down in her grave in hope that the compression of the grave will become easy upon her because she was my mother after my mother. She was my mother after my mother. Look at how the Prophet honored these women. That he lay down. He didn't lie down in the grave of a man. He lay down in the grave of this woman before she was buried into that grave. Why? In hope. In showing his loyalty towards her. In showing her uh, appreciation for all of the care and love that she showed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa this is the character that we learn from our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam towards our women. We need to portray that character. We need to become ambassadors of that character. And if we don't, then we will have people say, if I had met you before Islam, I wouldn't have become Muslim. But luckily I met Islam first. We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that he makes our women learned and he teaches our men and that he allows us to become people who search for the religion and search for knowledge of this religion, Ya Rabbil Alameen wa Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. Oh Allah, we ask you that you accept this gathering and you make it a means of our forgiveness in this world and in the next, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, we ask you that you forgive our shortcomings and you overlook our sins and you make us righteous and pious and people of knowledge and understanding, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, people who honor and respect 
women and their mothers and their wives, Ya Rabbil Alameen, oh Allah, and make our wives, our mothers, our daughters, <coughs> true ambassadors for Sayyida Fatima Zahra, radiyallahu anha, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Make them true ambassadors for the great scholarly women of Islam, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Make them ambassadors for, that, for, for the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for the daughters of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and for the female companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, <coughs> and oh Allah, fill them with such love and such dignity and such honor that they can part all of that to their children uh, who, 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 who then grow up to become the blossoming flowers of Islam, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. Oh Allah, forgive us our parents our teachers and the entire Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. O Allah, we ask you to reward all of the brothers and sisters who have made this gathering possible today, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Reward their efforts, reward their deeds, and show them the fruits of their works in this world and in the next, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We are Hamar Rahimeen. O Allah, we ask you that you make us amb true ambassadors for Islam in these lands, and you bring the light of Islam by means of each and every one of us, to the hearts of the people of these lands, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Wa Ya Arhamar Rahimeen, Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Izzati Amma Yasifoon, Wa Salamun Ala Al Mursaleen, Wa Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Can you tell the reason why after divorce, the children should go to the men? بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وآله وصحبه أجمعين. In this case, after divorce, there is nothing set whether the children should go to the men or not. What the scholars have said is that the children should stay with the one whom it is more beneficial for them to stay with. Who is it more beneficial for the children to stay with? They should stay with that parent. But the scholars gave some guidelines, possible guidelines, not, nothing concrete. They said that it might be more easier for the boys to be with the father so that they can pick up manly traits and manly characteristics. And for the girls to be with the mother because she will know uh, how to care for them or rather the father won't really know how to bring them up uh, as girls. So this is what the earlier scholars said. But in our times, in our times, it's possible that for example, one of the parent is not fit enough, maybe mentally or spiritually, is not fit enough to look after the children. Then the children should go to the other. Whether it's the mother or the father, it doesn't matter. Is that clear? So really and truly this is left to whatever is more beneficial for the children. Is that clear? <coughs> okay, then we have a question. What about women being scholars for the sake of educating adults? Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha she used to teach the Sahaba radiallahu anhum in the masjid. Is that clear? So it's fine for women to be teachers of men also, teachers of adults. Uh, have you had female teachers? Yes, I have. Right? And one of, uh, one of my teachers, she's from Germany. Her name is Ustaza Maryam, who is the wife of my friend, Sheikh Mahmoud Kalna. Right? Sheikh Mahmoud Kalna, his wife, she is a great scholar of Islam. She memorized the Quran in all 10 dialects. She studied in Damascus and in Mecca and Medina for 10 years. Day and night, all she did was study. So uh, sisters can maybe contact her if they need to, uh, or even visit them in Germany. Germany is not too far from here and they have a retreat coming up in May. So. Uh, and why are there less female scholars outside the home today than it was before? It's a good question that I, I want the answer to also. But that's our fault. Isn't that right? Yeah. That people... Uh, see, one of my teachers, he said that we need to encourage, as the community, we need to encourage women to become scholars for them to become scholars. Is that clear? But if we don't encourage them, then they will never come out. And it's 
even more of a need in our times than ever before that we have women scholars why because the society is developing so quick and advancing so fast that young girls really and truly need women who can speak to them who can uh, address their concerns is that clear men can only do it to some some extent uh, but if they have women scholars who can sit with them and comfort them and care for them this would be much better So the question is what advice do you have for women who have to work and look after the house and don't have much time uh, to go to the masjid for, for studies uh, see we have to be sensible and we have to be uh, we always have to be sensible when when we sometimes come into the religion we become overexcited we become overexcited and we try to do things that are beyond us right Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not burden us with that which is beyond us Allah said la yukallifullahu nafsan illa wusa'aha Allah does not burden a person except with that which they can carry and, and and they can bear so sometimes we become overwhelmed and overexcited we shouldn't be like this we should be balanced in what we do so if this is the case that a woman needs to work and also look after the family and so on doesn't get much time she should just try to find the opportunities that she can and study uh, and 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 try to just fulfill all of her duties that she has also What can I do to increase my khushu'? Is that the question khushu'? Is that right? That okay. word, the last word? Looks like that. The problem is, it's from the women. So, yeah, so you guys can't work it out, huh? <laughs> <laughs> is that <Looks> khushu'? Like <laughs> yes, khushu'. Yes, okay. Um, I, was, I was asked this question once before, and I said, um, in the reply to the question, to increase khushu in uh, a prayer and last time it was from a woman too so you know what I said I said uh, leave one of your most favorite foods and stop eating it abandon one of your most favorite foods and your khushu in your prayer will increase why one of the reasons of the lack of khushu is the heaviness of our stomachs when our stomachs are too heavy, our hearts fall asleep. Isn't that right? But when our stomachs are empty, uh, we are more focused and concentrating. You know, in England, we have a saying that, you know, if you're at work, uh, the managers try to get all of the work done before lunchtime. You know why? Because after lunch, nobody wants to do anything. <laughs> Their stomachs are too heavy <coughs> to do anything. Is that clear? So. To have khushur in the heart, the stomach needs to be empty. So cut down on some of the foods that you really enjoy and really like. Sorry, there was a question on here too. It's gone up. Okay, sometimes we hear brothers say that they don't want to marry a woman who is more knowledgeable than the brothers but in the same time we want to find a spouse who is knowledgeable enough to be the teacher of our children how should we approach how should our approach be so they don't want a woman who's more knowledgeable because she might end up teaching them <laughs> which means that they need to kill their nafs and ego and become humble because if you don't be humble in learning you can't learn anything and Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas he said man humani la yata'allaman two types of people who don't learn mustahin or mustakbir 
the one who is arrogant and the one who is shy. So don't be arrogant if your wife knows more than you. Just sit at her feet and learn from her. No. And you should be uh, happy that she knows more than you. You should, so that you can learn. <coughs> It'd be easy access to knowledge for you. Go ahead. I don't know, I haven't heard of that and uh, I, I haven't heard of that. Because women, women are... Oh, sorry, okay. So uh, the sister's asking, why is it that when we go to YouTube, we never find women teaching? Because women teach on real platforms. Women teach on real platforms, whereas when you go to YouTube, you don't know who you're listening to. Yeah. You have to verify your, your teacher before you can actually study. Yeah. No. But is it wrong also to teach public as well? It's not wrong. No. No, the women of Islam have always been doing it. Recently, there was a woman that we heard of who was in Egypt, who had been teaching books of hadith for 60, 70 years to male students and female students. Go ahead. Uh, again, every case needs to be dealt with individually. Um, so in, in modern day societies, the children just go straight to the mother. But I know in England what happens is the children go to the mother, but then the father also has opportunity of meeting the children and staying the children staying over with the father and so on. Right? Um, so it depends what's best for the children. Uh, in, in every case so if it's best for the children to stay with the mother then they should do so if it's best to move on to the father then they should do so um, or if both of them are equal then they should decide amongst them who takes the children but not prevent the other of visit, uh, allowing the children to be visited and, and so on right and sometimes what happens is when there's a divorce case uh, the spouse, the ex-spouses are so bitter about each other that they fill the minds of their children with disrespect for the other, right? Uh, just to take their own back on the other, but then they don't realize that this will have a bad effect on the upbringing of those children. So these are very uh, sensitive cases that people need to deal with utmost sensitivity really. Where you have mother and father working 
and the way you have the mother and the father uh, not knowledge, knowledgeable about the Islamic uh, issues. Should they send their children to the mosques so they can learn things? Or should they have a small family time by shutting down the TV and iPads and all this? Any uh, suggestions? You have? A very tricky question. <coughs> Uh, so he's saying if the mother and the father, both of them are working, where should we drop the children? Yeah. <laughs> should we drop them at the masjids and the madrasas, which are a part-time uh, babysitting services? This is what I call them. I call them part-time babysitting services. Right? Or should the parents uh, take time out to sit with their children and teach their children? Of course, the parents should sit with their children even if it's a very short period of time, even if it's 10-20 minutes a day, that will have greater impact and effect than send them to the masjid. Because the children will feel that we're just being uh, sent to a babysitting service, that our parents are too busy for us. Do you get it? So even if it's 20 minutes, that's a lot, a lot of time. 20 minutes of quality time that the children have every single day from the parents, that will be enough for the Islamic side. Of course, it should increase as they get older, as they're learning and progressing more. But, you know, it should start from somewhere. And if the parents can give that time and then send them to the masjid, that's fine. But if they send them to the masjid without giving them that time, then the masjid will have, the masjid will have a rebellious effect on them as they grow up. You know, in America, they had a, done a research that most children who went to Sunday school as Christians when they grew up, they left Christianity and rebelled. Why? Because they said, what we learned at church, we never practiced at home. <coughs> and don't you think that's the case for Muslims now? <coughs> that looks like a messy. <laughs> Could you just take the microphone a bit closer? <coughs> So um, basically one of the sisters, she saw a dream of her mother uh, passing away and then when she woke up, uh, before she was passing away, she said to her mother, say la ilaha illallah, that she's not Muslim and then she, her mother fainted and she woke up and she said, I saw a door in paradise open up for me and the sister is saying, what does this dream mean and can you pray for my mother to accept Islam? So we have hopes that inshallah this dream is a good sign that she will accept Islam before she leaves this world. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides her heart and makes her heart soft to accept the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the finality of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, I don't know if it's out of context this year. I have a question about the word qawamun. I wonder if you could collaborate a little bit about this word. Ar-rijalu qawamun? The meaning, yes, the meaning of it. Qawwamun, uh, it comes from Qa'im, which means to be established. Right? So Allah said, Ar-rijalu qawwamun ala nisa That men are established above women. I.e., they are the ones who are to take care of women uh, like an establishment. Right? When you have like an establishment, the, the administrators and the office deals with everything else. This is the case of a man in a home. Right? This is the case of a husband who takes care of the house and one of the names for for the uh, for the husband or the fa father in arabic is rabbul bayt the lord of the house right not lord of the kings lord of the house why because he has to administer everything is that clear no. uh, i heard about something i'm not sure but i heard that uh, maybe 
women or a woman uh, who wants who wants to establish a mosque for for women, just for women. And, and, and I think it was in Dan So I'm just wondering what is the reason for this and uh, what is the effects that I mean to ask about the there's a lot of discussions about women. I'm not from Denmark, so you'll have to ask your local imams. <laughs> what was the question? The question was about uh, women establishing their mosques and becoming imams. So uh, I said um, I'm a traveler, so I'm not from Denmark or Sweden, by the, the way. The problem with that mosque is that the uh, female imams want to uh, hold the khutbas for women, and that, that isn't permissible. That's where the issue is, if that was a question, if, it, if it's an issue. The, sis the sister's giving you a fatwa. <laughs> no, because... No, I'm, I'm not being I, I, sarcastic. I'm, I'm being real. I talked with Sheikh Salahuddin about it because yes. we were interviewed last week about that mosque. Yeah. So he told me that it wasn't permissible, permissible for women to hold a Friday prayer for women. So and this sister has the answer for you. <laughs> One more time? Yeah, yeah. so she, she will say her answer. Is that okay? So if you say it a bit louder. Uh, the issue with that mosque is that a female uh, imam can't hold the Friday prayer for others, even it's only for females, because it, it is impermissible for a, a woman to hold the khutbah or the Friday prayer. So the issue isn't a female uh, leading the prayer, because she can do that in some uh, schools, Shafi and Hanbal, I think. So that's the only issue with the, the Maria mosque in uh, Denmark. So that's the answer that Sheikh Salahuddin gave. You need to search for Sheikh Salahuddin. Mm -hmm. He's in Stockholm. He's where? Stockholm. Stockholm. Uh, I came across a list some weeks ago. I don't know, I can't verify how truthful it is, but it was like a list of all the female scholars that have been teaching Imam al uh, and they numbered up to like 160 different scholars. Mashallah. So this is not really a religious question, more of a historical one, but like percentually, how many female scholars did the, yeah, how many were female scholars were actually active in the Islamic Middle Ages? Was it 50-50 or 25-75 or how? how, how Good question. It? When you find the answer, let me know too. Okay. 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 But is there any indication of us actually knowing? Well, you'll have to look for it, isn't it? Okay. Search for it and find out. Cheers. Are we done? Uh, I have uh, like a question from uh, the students in Islam Academy. You know, we're studying under Sheikh Salahuddin. And we're just wondering if you could uh, like give us some advi advice about uh, learning like being a scholar and, you know, um, and how we can encourage people to uh, study the religion and uh, mostly women, how can we encourage them to study? Mm. See, I don't know of your activities, what you are already doing, mm. um, so it's a bit tricky. So, uh, Allah says, Muhammad, it's very important to let people know about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. See, <coughs> one of the major reasons why Islam stayed very strong amongst the non-Arab Muslims was because of their affiliation to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and their connection unto him and their love for him and their appraisals for him. So this is what needs to be revived in our communities that we speak about the Prophet ﷺ and we introduce him to Muslims and to non-Muslims and then we'll see how people flock to come and study the religion. This is very important. Uh, somebody's asking, we see on Facebook that you post a lot of pictures of locations where the Prophets have been and have lived. How did you start that travel and have you been in all that locations? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
I've been to the, the I've been to all of those locations in the same that way that all of you have been, just on the Facebook page. <laughs> so inshallah, hopefully we can get there one day. It's our lost heritage. No. Are we done? Okay, inshallah. سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة بسم